Travis, so glad to be with you. Tell us uh, a little bit to start about your own uh, background with Christianity and when you first ever questioned your faith and, you know, maybe, maybe kind of walk through some of the personal things that led to this book. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me on, Ed. I really appreciate it um, and team. Uh, so, yeah, I grew up in a very Christian setting, so about as Christian as it could possibly be. My my folks were both in the ministry, and it was a ministry started by my great-great-grandfather. Wow. So there's kind of that legacy uh, bit there that that definitely features or, or figures in for me. Um, we were in church anytime the doors were open, you know, grew up going to Sunday school, youth group. Yeah, I mean, you name it, camps, retreats, uh, mission trips, even international mission trips, uh, and kind of did that whole process uh, without um, actually asking, why should I believe? And so there was this really particular moment um, in seminary, actually, which is not a completely uncommon thing for seminarians to question and doubt their faith, but um, was sitting in a, a classroom and... Um, it just hit me. I I just realized it was a it was a class it was a class on world religions, and I think what I felt was that we were giving Christianity a pass as as we can sometimes do, uh, in the church and in in uh, even in seminary, where we were hypercritical of other religious traditions, and yet the the Christian tradition was sort of getting a pass. I felt like, and so, but what it, what it stirred in my heart, I think, was that. I'm the one giving Christianity a pass and I've done it my whole life. And so um, one thing that I think is important to mention is that I, I sincerely believed it wasn't, it wasn't that I was, I realized I didn't really believe it was that I did believe, but, but my reasons for believing was what uh, kind of got thrown into, um, uh, you know, questioning and, and that sort of thing and, and realized that I think I kind of just believed because you know, my grow my growing up experience. It was my parents wanted me to, and my grandparents wanted me to, and the minister, you know, that whole thing. Um, I sincerely believe, but I didn't believe because I had found it to be true. And I think that's a really uh uh important distinction to make. Um, and so for me, I I had to lean in because I didn't know these other traditions or even atheism or even agnosticism was true either. I had to, I had to lean in. And so my story and really the reason for the book is that I found a lot of answers. I found a lot of truth, uh, not to say I've got it all figured out. Uh, I, I'm always quick to say that I'm still in process. I'm still on the journey. And I think that's a that's a I'm comfortable there. Uh, I mean, it can be uncomfortable, but I'm overall comfortable with that sort of uh, in process place. Um, but what I found in that time is that I found truth and and it caused my faith to grow. And that's kind of the irony is that we're, what the very thing that I think we're scared of when it comes to doubts and questions, my leaning in led me to truth and a greater faith. Love it. And the book, to remind everyone, is Wandering Toward God, Finding Faith Amid Doubts and Big Questions. Okay, so so you, you have this um, epiphany where you kind of explore some of these things. And I do think it's really worth noting that, um, you know, I, I just preached Sunday at the time of this recording, the Sunday before we recorded this, I preached at my own church from 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. And I and I talked about, there are times when I have just, maybe, probably in hard times, I've like doubted, you know, Lord, is this all real? Yeah. And the example I gave Sunday was, uh, you know, I mean, you got to explore what are the religions? What are, You know, I use the example of Mormonism and, and Islam, where basically, you know, in both cases, angels visit these these prophetic leaders um, one in a cave, one one in upstate New York, and um, and and you know basically give these private revelation that then spreads around the world, and you know in millions upon millions uh, people would believe. Um, yet Christianity makes quite a different claim. First Corinthians fifteen, uh, yeah. quite a different claim. Appeared the word appeared is used four times over this short description that Paul gives, including to five hundred people, where Paul basically says, and they're still alive. Go check at their house. They're living yeah. in Main Street. You can go knock on the door. So Christianity seems uniquely and unapologetically, hey, there's evidence that's here. You don't have to believe just yeah. one person. So so talk to us a little bit about why Christianity is framed that way uh, in way, you know, compared to other religions of faith. Why, why does that matter? Yeah, and that was a big piece for me. I mean, that's that's interesting that you say that, because I think for me, it, it was also 1 Corinthians 15, where I yep. saw Paul just sort of 
lay the whole thing out as if you if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. Um, so that it really turns on this, really turns on the historicity of that event. Right. And you just yep. don't see that in other religious traditions. Um, that was a big yeah, moment for me. But they're alive. Go talk to them. Like, yeah, go, right. go down the street. I, I just, I'm fascinated by that. That to me, I said Sunday, this to me is the passage I go to when I've had doubts. That's right. That's but anyway, right. there's more, but keep going. Yeah, yeah. And so when, for me in, you know, this, on this journey, in this moment, I really dove into the other religious traditions too, and was trying to find, okay, where are their sort of equivalent to our apologetics departments, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of a thing. And honestly, couldn't really find them. I mean, not to say they're non-existent in all, all other religious traditions, but so it is completely absent, it seems to me, in some religious traditions. Some of the more Eastern traditions aren't even trying to sort of say that this is true and based on historical events. It's just not a it's not a way in which they approach those matters. And so, yeah, I think I, that's the way I sort of think of the gospel in a way is to say, you should believe because this is true. Does it have all kinds of other benefits? And might there be other social pressures? Uh, you know, might my parents and others be really happy? Yeah, th those things are all there too, of course. And I think it does lead to human flourishing. And, you know, we can get into all that too. But I think ultimately it boils down to, I mean, you just think of Paul. Paul is is claiming you should believe because this is true, and and, and here's here's the reasons why, and here here here's evidence to think that. Now, I think one way that people get a little, um, you know, uh, to, uh, sort of pause on this is because they feel like it it becomes overly academic, and that's one of the big things that I like to remind ourselves is that this need not be, I mean, is there, are there tremendous resources out there that can, you know, you know, just exercise the brightest uh, bulbs out there? I think so. Um, but there's also really accessible stuff. And the thing that we always have to keep in mind is that the pursuit here is the pursuit of a person. It's not mm -hmm. a pursuit of a system or a doctrine or even an intellectual belief. It's the pursuit of God. Um, and so I, I take it when Jesus says the most important thing for us to do, the greatest commandment is to love God with all of who we are. And he includes in that the mind. But it's not only an intellectual pursuit. I just think that's a really important part of the journey. Yeah. And I, I think it's really essential that we lean in on issues of doubt. And, yeah. um, and, and I think, you know, our audience is, of course, pastors and church leaders. And even like when I preach my sermon, I told people that there are times I have doubted. And um, and again, I, I mentioned I go to this passage and others. Um, but there's almost a sense that as a pastor and a church leader, you know, I, I tend to be pretty transparent when I teach and preach. Um, as a pastor and church leader, you're supposed to kind of allay people's doubts, to address people's doubts, not not um, not kind of identify with their doubts. So talk to us a little bit about how you would encourage, you're an elder in your local church, how would you encourage church leaders, pastors and church leaders to uh, to walk through those doubts? What would that journey yeah. look like? So I think that, you know, one of the things I say in the book is that our, our churches don't tend to be uh, a safe place for people to doubt their faith. Um, and I think that one of the primary things that I think pastors and church leaders need to do is really cultivate a culture. Now, it's we got to be careful, too, because I think there are various ones out there, you know, these sort of hipster uh, online sort of figures who are sort of celebrating doubt and pushing deconstruction even, um, as if doubt is the place um, to end, you know, like it's an end in itself. Uh, so my catchphrase is that doubt is not uh, the destination, um, right? It's not where we want to end up. And so what I, what I, really think a, a pastor needs to do, though, is cultivate a culture where it's a safe place to. I mean, my goodness, it's like if you're doubting your faith, wouldn't we want people to come to the church in order to find their answers rather than Google or or some other source like that? Um, and so, so, and I think that takes a lot of intentionality. Um, I think that one, the the pastor, as, as you said, Ed, that you 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 were you're pretty authentic and transparent. I think that's crucial for a pastor to um, 
make reference to the the fact that he has you know walked this journey too and struggled here and there uh again i don't think we have to sort of always lay out our dirty laundry but at least sort of talk about the wins and talk about the fact that like this was an important uh role for me uh or impor important moment for me or whatever um i i think a lot of the church setting and the the home setting have a lot of parallels of course and so uh, we, we do this, uh, you know, I, I always say like my, my purpose in a lot of this material is of course for the church and of course for the world, but it's, you know, I've got four kids myself who are teenagers and preteens. So they're, they're really just on the journey. Like if you're a kid, you're on the journey in that way. And so, uh, I don't want my kids to doubt their faith, but I kind of do. I kind of mm -hmm. want them to go through those times where they're they're struggling a little bit like i don't know how to think of this and i want to cultivate a, a sort of culture in my home where they feel comfortable to say i don't understand this i don't i don't know how to put these two things together or i heard this and that out there you know i would much rather that than and them struggle through it and sort of doubt their faith a little bit than them being a biology class somewhere on a state campus and just be in the throes of it with no, you know, with me, you know, absent and, and not in our home. And so anyway, I think it's a very good thing. So long as we don't make that the destination, that that's the yeah. end. It's this is this is opportunity for us to lean in and ask those difficult questions and love God with our minds. Uh, and so the pastor, I think, needs to cultivate that, be authentic, be transparent and just provide ways. It's it's not as easy as you might think to really provide, you know, sort of cultivate that culture. But I think in small group settings and mentorship settings and and just ringing that bell often that, hey, if you have questions, if you're in that, if you're on that journey and you don't have it all figured out, guess what? I don't either. So, you know, let's talk. I think just cultivating that kind of culture at the church is just crucial. Okay, so let's so let's talk about what that looks like. Uh, partly, it's going to be transparency from pastors and church leaders. So when he or she gets up and says, "You know, I've doubted. Here's where I walk through that." In a sense, I mean, and this is part that people can see in wandering toward God. Even your own story is honest and transparency, which I think encourages others towards honesty and transparency. You don't want people to think that they will they have to question alone in the dark. Yeah. Um, I think ultimately we want to walk with people. So for the pastors and church leaders who listen, right, we've got all kinds of staff members in different roles. Um, how can he or she um, create, you talk about creating that culture, but now we want to help the yeah. people in our church to walk through that. What are some ways that you would encourage to help them uh, wander without being lost? Yeah, good. Um, you just like that phrase, I know. I know, I know. I'm a Tolkien <laughs> fan, so... Uh, <laughs> Let's see. So I would say, you know, the I, I mean, I'm convinced that the primary people who are going to do this ministry are probably not the pastors. It's going to be the parents. Um, right. And so I think you need to, of course, cultivate the culture for uh, people just in general to come and ask their questions and so on. But I do think if a pastor were to really get intentional about this, it's going to need to. Uh, kind of translate into ministry training uh, for their parents, where mm -hmm. parents are, uh, again, I, I think they need a certain level of content um, because there's just going to be, there's just certain questions that get asked. I mean, the problem of evil. Uh, yeah. And let me, let me say too, so you yeah. don't, so you don't have to, it, that's the second half of the book too. We go, it goes through some of these yeah. questions like the problem of evil and more, but keep going. How do, how do you yeah. help equip parents? So I think equipping parents with there's going to be have to be some of that content because there's just certain questions that are going to come up. Uh, I had a conversation with my son this week about uh, dinosaurs uh, and why we don't see those in the Bible. And for him, that's and he's 11. So he's not like fixated on dinosaurs like, you know, younger boys can kind of tend to be. But um, but it's it was for him a bit. And then now he's sort of asking these questions. And I think you know, the take, taking seriously the first Peter 3.15 of, of being ready to be prepared. Um, and that's, I, that's the way I think I see the pastor's role um, uh, most primarily is to equip the parents um, to be able to sort of, uh, you know, minister to the kids in this way and disciple their kids 
this way. But one of the things we've done, we've done series of apologetics. Um, we've we've brought people in. I've I've helped with that at our church. Um, and then we've also tried to sort of work it in, you know, kind of come back to it periodically so that as those th times um you know, kind of circle back, they're able to sort of bring the that that um their their questions and and plug the holes that they had and and so on to equip them to be able to do it. But you know, a big part of it is is establishing the relationship with your kids too, I think. Um again, being sort of earning the right to speak into their life. Uh that I I think I think you know, so I'm I'm a generate generation Xer. I'm Generation yeah. X. I'm kind of at the tail end of it, but uh, and I'm the I, other side of it. But are you okay? Gen X for the okay, win. all right, all right. For the yeah. one, uh, I think we. No, but nobody cares about us. Just for the record, nobody cares <laughs> about right. at all. We're like at all. It's like totally irrelevant to the rest of people. But you and I, we're rejoicing in this right. slacker moment. Right. But keep right. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, but I think as you know, we tend to be bad as parents in some way. It's like the parenting trends uh, are that we protect them from everything outside of the house. So they're, you know, if our kid's going out, they're going to have a helmet on, uh, you know, on a bike or whatever. Uh, we're not going to let them do a bunch of stuff. We're going to be at every event that's going on outside of the home. But then inside the home, we just let them do whatever that we want them to do. Mm -hmm. There's no protection, you know, so screens and everything else is just sort of uh, often tends to be no, um, no rules and so on. And so I think cultivating that relationship inside the home in order to earn the right to speak into their, you know, speak in, and answer their questions, to be that sort of trusted person in their life that they would go to. So anyway, that's probably not a very uh, succinct answer, but- uh, No, I think it's helpful. I think, I think you're, those you're are the kind of sorts of things. That you're the walking through the field with us. And I think yeah. that's part of what we're trying to figure out. And I think a lot of people are trying to figure out because they feel that, I mean, statistically, there's not this huge wave of deconstruction. Um, you know, right. the reality is most people who stop identifying as Christian we're very nominally Christian, That's right. you know, the one, oh, maybe 2% a year, depending on the year. Um, but the reality is, is there, there is, I mean, we can name names of people who've walked away. My, my colleague here at, uh, at Wheaton, uh, Michael Lee wrote a, a 3000 word article for outreach magazine. We'll put it, we'll put it in the show notes on, he did his PhD on the deconstruction, uh, deconversion of Christian missionaries and pastors. Right. So, so this is very real. And I think social media has sort of elevated some of those voices. Some of them were prominent because of family connections or prominent because of their own ministry. So so that gets our attention. Um, so what do you make of the people, um, you know, particularly Christian leaders and influencers who've been uh deconstructing? What what yeah. how do you how do you how do you how do you think and how should we respond? Yeah. I mean, as concept, I I like the idea of deconstructing. So I, I'm a little different than some of that's, my That's going to be the clip colleagues. we're going to take out of this program <laughs> right, right, and run it right. over and over and, again. And yeah. I'll, yeah. Um, some of my colleagues, you know, have really kind of freaked out about it. And as concept, I'm, I'm, that's, that's a lot of what I'm talking about is asking those deep and difficult questions and really probing. And if we want to call that deconstruction, that's, that's, I'm not completely against that. The problem is that deconstruction is a negative concept though. So it's really incomplete in a way, because nobody just deconstructs. They always then construct something in place of whatever they could have sort of taken apart and thrown away. And so and that's what doesn't get talked about, because it's easy to say, I don't believe such and such. But it's much harder to say, I believe this. And here are my reasons why. And so what I want to know from you know, the various ones uh, who have, who have, de so, you know, deconstructed is what have you constructed in its place? Um, it's kind of like the, I don't know if you uh, get into the debates with atheists and Christians and so on. It's, it's not, a, not, not always the, the, you know, the most constructive situation, but anyway, sure. uh, atheists, there's, there's a certain brand that will say, look, atheism is just the denial of theism, which in a technical sense, okay, maybe, um, right? And so they, but the reason to do that, it's sort of uh, genius in one sense, because rhetorically, they don't have to give any evidence for their view, because they're just saying, hey, I'm just not convinced. I, I don't think your evidence is any good. Uh, that's all atheism is. It's the denial of theism. But 
I, I think that short circuits our discussion in a way because I want to say, well, okay, well then what do you believe? And let's have a discussion about that. Like there is a rhetorical burden for you to take here. And I think that the so-called deconstructionists sort of uh, try to try to th- you know avoid that burden as well to say, okay, well then what do you believe about reality? Okay, if you don't believe that God exists, if you don't believe that Christianity is true, if you've sort of deconstructed those, let's hear about right. Which again, that's it's okay to be on that journey to ask those questions and to change your beliefs. I mean, I think we really need to do that. I think if you know somebody from a different religious tradition came to us and said. Hey, I'm I'm asking questions about this. Should I really press in? We would say, yes, of course you should. Doubt mm-hmm. your faith, uh, right? But we we need to be consistent in that and and say that we need to do the same thing too. But it's all for the effort of finding out what's true. It's all for the effort of finding out what we do in fact know. And so deconstruction is fine for what it is. But don't stay there. Like we need to now focus on what do we construct in pl- in place of whatever it is we've changed, if we've so changed talk, it all. Yeah. So let's let's talk about um, how people should respond, or how as pastors and church leaders we would want to encourage them to respond. Again, I remind everyone the book is Wandering Toward God: Finding Faith Amid Doubts and Big Questions. But I mean, the subtitle is Finding Faith Among yep. Doubts and Big Questions. So what's the relationship between faith, doubt, and unbelief? And can we have certainty that Christianity actually is true and real? Yeah. Just easy ones, right? Yeah, just, just light, light to- topics. <laughs> uh, so I I make a big point in the book to say that faith and doubts, um, having faith and having some doubts is completely fine. It's completely consistent. You don't have, there's no sort of inconsistency there. Um, and the reason why is because what faith is, is when we place trust in something and you can, you know, so long as you place trust in it, you do in fact have faith. Um, you can do that with a little bit of wavering, with a little bit of uncertainty, with a little bit of question. And I think even some doubts. So I, I like to use the example of getting on an airplane. If I'm honest, I don't know a lot about how airplanes <laughs> even work. Uh and I could find myself in a place of questioning and doubting that uh, a million pounds of metal should be able to lift off the ground and cruise at six miles off the planet. Like that's kind of insane when we think about it. Uh, but insofar as I get on board the airplane, I am placing my faith in the airplane. And so I think a kind of beautiful picture of the Christian journey is we can imagine somebody sitting on the airplane doubting that this should even be working having all kinds of questions while flying, uh, while being on the airplane. And so I think that's often where we're at is that we uh, come to Christ. We've got lots of questions. We've got lots of areas in which we need to sort of work it out still. But we can we can be on board while we're sort of still working it out. I think there's no problem with that. Um, we can be on board while we're still working it out. I think that's an important yeah. distinction that not everybody is 100% uh, convinced maybe even yeah. while they're on that journey and sometimes may, may wander through that. That's so, right. okay. So, so keep going. Okay. So unbelief though, I mean, that's, that really is. So I, I use a lot the, uh, great Oz Guinness quote, uh, that doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is, yeah. um, and I think that's right. So like unbelief is right. When we, when we have doubts, it sort of assumes that we still believe because you wouldn't be doubting. You would just be in a place of unbelief. The, 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 what you're in fact doubting are the beliefs that you have. And so we're not, again, I don't want anybody to stay there though. That's why I'm trying to sort of navigate a, a, a path here between overemphasizing and over celebrating doubt, but also not ignoring it because I think it's an important moment for us. Um, but you mentioned certainty, and I want to talk about that because I think that Please. we do a real disservice to our kids and, and our people, uh, talking to the pastors now in our churches, when we act like we've got it all figured out, when we act like we have 100% certainty about every matter of Christian doctrine and faith and, and practice. And so, and the reason is because I think our kids, uh, think, well, I have to have certainty. 
and and they sort of drum up this attitude. Well, I've got certainty. I'm certain that it's true. And then they get into a college campus somewhere, you know, somebody starts sort of or a workplace setting and somebody starts pressing them on some belief of some objection. All of a sudden they don't have certainty and the whole thing comes crashing down. It's oftentimes I've seen this with uh, kids and just people in general that walk away from the faith given an objection that has a really good answer. Uh, there are there are whole books that have been written addressing that very question, but because that threw them into this place of uncertainty, they they just sort of walked away because they thought faith uh, must be a matter of certainty. So I have a whole chapter on the book in the book on this that's called um, if I remember right, certainty is a house of cards. It always amuses think... me when, when authors can't remember their books. I <laughs> right, do the same right. thing because you write it like a year before it's published. Right, What's right. my chapter title? Okay. Right, right. But Walking it's a house certainty. of house of cards. Uh, which, right, I don't know who has the time on their hands to do these things, but if you see them, these, you know, really large house of cards where somebody has balanced playing cards and constructed this whole thing, well, it's kind of by its very nature precarious, where you pull one card out, the whole thing comes crashing down. If our faith is, I think, aimed at certainty, then our, our faith might be a house of cards in that same sense. Because one question, all it takes is one question, and that whole thing comes crashing down. Where what I say is that we need to aim at not certainty, but confidence. Mm -hmm. Because confidence can tolerate some questions. Because again, as you said, and as I'm, I say all the time, that I've got some questions. I've yeah. got some things that I'm still working out. So I don't have absolute certainty sitting here right here right now. Um, and so if faith required certainty... I guess I don't have faith, right? But that that's crazy. It's aim for something like confidence. I am confident that Christianity is true, 100% confident. In fact, I've given my life to it. I've gotten on board again. Like I've, I've, I've given my whole, uh, all of who I am to it because I'm confident in its truth while I still am on the journey sort of working out some questions as I go. Good. It's good. I, I love the uh, the endorsements on the back of your book since they're almost all from Talbot, but that's another story for another <laughs> right, day. Right. Because, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, I mean, this is a new, new role for me. You know, we have a significant apologetics program. Absolutely. But I'm very enthusiastic about it because I think as culture becomes more secular, apologetics becomes really a, a part of the mission, you know, just at a higher and higher level. People yeah. have questions. You got to kind of work through those questions as well. So what encouragement do you have for pastors and church leaders who are um, kind of walking through with people? Maybe, you know, in your case, you grew up in a Christian home. I didn't. So my journey is obviously different, but my kids obviously did. Yeah. Uh, but but somebody who's who's not a follower of Jesus, but is trying to walk through and think through. I, I just listened to a podcast uh, where Molly Worthen, Worthen um, she's a professor at the University of North Carolina. Who's written uh, Apostles of Reason? I'm citing it in my in my book for on a future evangelicalism, and she just walked through her conversion. She's now a follower of Jesus, been baptized uh, at Summit Church by J.D. Greer, and you know here's this you know tenured professor at the University of North Carolina. Fascinating, fascinating journey. But clearly, she she talks about in the podcast. Uh, Colin Hansen did the podcast, uh, Gospel Coalition podcast. She talks about how. They just walked with her, JD, and actually Tim Keller. It's got to be nice if you have JD Greer and Tim Keller as your right, conversation right. partners on this right, journey. Right. Um, but but they kind of walk through those questions and spend time with her sharing that journey. So what should how should we do that? Should we say, hey, let's read this book and talk about it together? So put yourself in the pastor and church leader hat. Um, yeah. he or she is engaging somebody who's got questions and doubts, not yet a Christian, maybe not grown up in a Christian home. What do you what do you encourage them to do? Yeah. So that first of all, I I want to again sort of encourage and you know I say in the book that if you're somebody with doubts and questions and and so on um, and struggling with it in, in particular, then it's probably because you're more honest uh, and and courageous in a way than than others because you're willing to sort of uh, look those problems in the in in the face and so on and so and. and so especially so you said a a, a, a non Christian, yeah. What, what I want to call who's got questions, who's doubting yeah. it, or thinking through it. Yeah. So I want to say I, I want to encourage that and just and just say how how awesome that is and and you know and and talk about how important it is 
for that person to find the answers and to just keep going. So just a word of encouragement, I think, is always the the sort of right posture with somebody who's seeking. Um, I also want to say that they need to uh, lean into those things and they need to find their answers and and don't take pastor's word for it. Don't take, you know, uh, an author's word for it or whatever, but do avail themselves of those resources because there are there are good answers. I mean, this is this is part of the Christian tradition as long as there's been a Christian tradition, as you mentioned, it, you know, perhaps starting, I mean, really starting with the life of Jesus. I mean, Jesus sure. is doing miracles for a reason. It's to give people reasons to believe, um, yeah. to give people evidence, if you like. Um, and so, and, and then Paul with laying out the the gospel in First Corinthians 15 and then naming names for eyewitnesses and so on and saying, you know, check, that's been, and, and all the way through with Augustine and all the way through his church history, that has been part of the Christian tradition and so on. And so lean into those things um, and avail yourself of those resources. I One of the things I think is really important for people who are struggling with doubts and, and questions is to not do it alone. Um, because there's a way in which when we are struggling, it it we 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 sort of isolate. We we have this sort of tendency to to do it alone. Um and I did alone, but but just to be honest, I I sort of did alone, though though I didn't do it walk through it with people necessarily. I, I walked through it with books. So I really had to <laughs> lean in and and I think that's important. So don't do it alone, do it in community. But also remember that our community, our Christian community is is large. Um, and it's some people that are no longer with us are still very, very helpful because of the the books that they wrote and the legacy that they've left. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's what I'd say there is just avail yourself of those things. And I think it's okay to press people. I think it's okay to press people when they, get, you know, say, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm, this is kind of where I'm landing. Um, I think it's very okay to press that answer. I mean, part of this for me too, um, is I, I get to teach philosophy here at Dallas Baptist University. And so, you know, that's kind of my area of specialization. And so like, that's just kind of the air we breathe. That's just kind of the, the, the culture of, uh, the philosophical world is to really press on, questions. And I think there's a way to do it that's, you know, mean and rude and, you know, it's likely to drive people away. But I think, um, I think pressing them on those questions. And maybe the last thing I would say too is, again, coming back to this idea that Jesus says the greatest commandment, the most important thing is to love God with all of our hearts, souls, and minds, notice. Um, I think, you know, the books out there in the world, you know, and I've had lots of these sort of interview interviews and podcasts and things that, that have been wonderful. One of the things, you know, you kind of have a few things crystallized for you that you, you, I did emphasize in the book, but I'd probably, if I had it to do over again, I'd, I'd do it. I'd emphasize this even more is the, the sort of posture that I recommend in, in asking these questions and, and seeking the Lord. I, if, if we take Matthew 22, 37 seriously that we're supposed to love God with our minds. Um, it's not a posture of a critic that we should ask these questions, right? Because if you have the posture of a critic or the posture of a skeptic where um, no answer will do, uh, you're going to kind of continually be critical. And I've got friends that are like this that I just think, you know, we have discussions and we have conversations, but it just seems that literally no matter what i say um they're still critical they're they're going to find ways to poke holes in it and i think if we have that posture we're very likely not to find the truth yeah. um the posture that i think jesus is recommending in a way is the posture of a lover uh the posture of somebody who is really seeking and pursuing so i always like to uh, you know, kind of illustrate that with the, the the couples that always form inevitably every every semester. The freshman class comes, and you have these couples that form, and you know it's the kind of thing where like the world could be on fire, and they're just locked into each other, and you know don't notice because um, they're just so in love or whatever. And what are they doing? Well, oftentimes they're just 
asking questions. Uh, they're want they're pursuing that person. They're wanting to know them in a deep way. And I think, I think that's the right sort of posture one should take as one seeks um, is to to seek it as someone who is a a lover or one who is as um, you know. Uh, really pursuing the truth, really pursuing to know that person. That's why I say it's not just a system or a belief that we're after. It's a person. Hmm. Travis, thanks for taking the time in the conversation. Yeah. I think it's an important conversation. Um, Andrew McDonald was actually, he works here at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. Um, he's a guy who was part of the judging process. And we're super thankful as the, as the general editor of Outreach Magazine, we're super thankful for wandering toward God finding faith amid doubts and big questions to be the apologetics book of the year resource. Thanks to Travis for joining us. You bet. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.